Next up, we have uh, Dr. Aaron Pierce. Dr. Pierce is going to be speaking on an approach to treatment-resistant depression. Dr. Pierce is a clinical professor of psychiatry at Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. He completed his medical degree at OSU College of Osteopathic Medicine and is board certified in psychiatry. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pierce. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Beeman. All right, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about how we might approach the patient with treatment-resistant unipolar depression. Now, this is going to be different than treating someone with bipolar depression. It's an altogether different ballgame with the type of medications that we use. In fact, that antidepressants that we typically use uh, for unipolar depression or major depressive disorder are not going to work very well for bipolar depression. So just kind of keep that in mind. So um, our objectives are first uh, to just talk a little bit how we diagnose major depressive disorder in general um, and uh, take into some considerations what we want to think about when we think someone might be treatment resistant, okay? And then finally, we'll look at some strategies uh, what, uh, for what we might do if someone is indeed uh, treatment resistant. So we're probably all familiar uh, with the DSM-5 criteria of uh, major depressive disorder. Essentially, you need five of these nine symptoms uh, to qualify uh, for a major depressive episode, one of which needs to be either depressed mood um, or loss of interest in activities or pleasure, also called anhedonia, okay? And it's important to um, understand that this isn't someone who's just having maybe a bad few days or a bad week or something like that. Depressed mood can be normal, right? We don't want to pathologize being down from time to time, right? But these people are, are certainly distressed, may even be functionally impaired to some extent, okay? Now, depression can be different in quality uh, than someone who might be grieving. Uh, people who are grieving will go through sort of pangs, these pangs of grief, right, where depression can kind of like come in waves, but gradually gets better uh, with time. Uh, patients who uh, are grieving also feel like things are going to get better with time, right? They're more hopeful. They have positive emotions like humor, and they tend to maintain their self-esteem, which is um, typically not the case with someone who might be depressed. Um, I also want to make note that when you're considering depression, you also want to think about different medical conditions that may be causing depressive symptoms, like untreated sleep apnea, untreated hypothyroidism. Those, those are two common things that we can come across that can cause depressive symptomatology. We want to think about substances. Maybe someone's drinking too much, maybe abusing stimulants, that kind of thing. That can certainly cause uh, depression. And these things can be during intoxication periods. and can also be in withdrawal periods. When we think about someone who may be abusing something like methamphetamine, cocaine, that kind of thing, the withdrawal states, uh, depression is a very common symptom because you have this precipitous drop in dopamine, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, we also want to clarify whether a person is having recurrent episodes of major depression, okay? That's going to be a little bit different in how we might approach our patient in terms of treatment. If it's the very first episode that someone's had with depression, we might want to treat it until it remits, of course, but, you know, after about nine, ten months of remission, then we might think about coming off this medication, okay? But if someone's had maybe three or more episodes of major depression, it's about 90% likely that they're going to have another episode of major depression. Okay, So you might have a, a, a discussion with the patient about continuing on an antidepressant indefinitely or really taking um, a hard look at, at, uh, at therapy to prevent uh, other depressive episodes uh, from occurring in the future. We think of um, treating, the, treating the major depressive episode until they remit, right? But you don't want to stop the antidepressant necessarily if they've, had a, if they've had a number of episodes of major depression. We think about this as almost being like a seatbelt, right? We haven't been in Iraq in years, but we still wear a seatbelt. We're going to try to prevent this uh, from recurring. Um, this is a common thing. About one in five of us will have had an episode of major depression in our life. Uh, this tends to be about twice as common in women. We're not really sure why this is the case. Uh, to some extent, this may be hormonal because the, uh, the differences between men and women um, in older age tends to sort of equalize. So in some extent, this may have to do uh, with hormones. Mean age of onset's around, around 30 years. Uh, this does tend to be a little bit more common in those who may be socially isolated, might have a lack of support, et cetera, and doesn't have any correlation with socioeconomic status. So when we think about what causes major depression, this is still a little bit of a mystery, okay? We don't have this completely understood by, by any means, okay? But we do know that there are biological factors involved. We know that there are psychosocial factors involved too. 
When we think about the monoaminergic system, these are the neurotransmitters that uh, we see antidepressants work on, right? We have serotonin reuptake inhibitors, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and some of our antidepressants even work on the reuptake of dopamine, right? When we think about dopamine, Dr. Beeman, I think, had probably mentioned some of this. Dopamine, when it's artificially increased through something like a stimulant medication, cocaine, that kind of thing, you're going to have this euphoric mood, elevated mood. And in withdrawal, you're going to have a precipitous drop-off in dopamine, which is going to bring on quite a lot of uh, depression. Acetylcholine, interestingly, uh, may be associated with, with depression. Uh, we know that some anticholinergic medications can have antidepressant qualities to them. Uh, thinking about something like scopolamine even has promise here. Uh, Procholinergic uh, medications can sometimes cause depressive symptoms from time to time, bisostigmine, et cetera. Glutamine and GABA, as we might remember, uh, are the principal excitatory inhibitory neurotransmitters in the brain, okay? When we think about glutamate, uh, we see this primarily in the mechanism of action of ketamine, which is I'm, I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit. Uh, ketamine blocks NMDA receptors, which is a glutamatergic receptor, okay? And by blocking this, it can increase dopamine. It can also increase something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, which is involved in neuronal growth, and it can help uh, support function. Um, GABA um, tends to play a role. When we think about depression, it can be kind of a lower GABAergic state in some, in some respects, okay? Uh, one of the newer um, uh, antidepressants that, that we've had approved uh, for postpartum depression called brexanolone uh, works specifically with, with this. It mimics um, a neurosteroid called allopregnanolone, which is produced by the corpus luteum and the placenta during pregnancy, okay? And it's very GABAergic in nature. And after delivery, we can have a precipitous drop-off in this neurosteroid, which it's thought to cause postpartum depression. Uh, this medication is given by infusion over a couple of days. It's very expensive. I've, I've, I think it's something like thirty or forty thousand dollars for an infusion of this. There's only one place in town that I know that that does that. Inflammation may play a role. There's a lot of research being dedicated to inflammation and depressed mood. Interestingly enough, we can even have sort of an inflammatory response to psychosocial stress, right? We can have an increased level of cytokines even when we get stressed out from from some sort of a stressful thing going on um, in our lives, right? Um, you can induce depressive states, anxious states, and research subjects through uh, injection of endotoxin. And this shouldn't be too much of a surprise. You know, when we get sick, even from something like a cold, right? We might have a cough and congestion, et cetera, but our mood's pretty crummy, okay? We think this may be as a, re a result of increased level of uh, different cytokines, specifically things like interleukin-6. Okay, how we think this might work is these cytokines have a negative impact on the synthesis of uh, some of these monoamines that I just got through men mentioning and can also increase the reuptake to some extent. It almost works as an anti-antidepressant. Interestingly enough, anti-inflammatory medications like uh, celecoxib even have some evidence to show that it might help with depressed mood. Um, genetically, we know this certainly plays a role. We can see a much higher concordance rate in uh, monozygotic twins versus uh, dizygotic. Psychosocially, we, this, is, this is no mystery to us. We know things that are going on in our lives, the way we think about ourselves, others, the future, the past, et cetera, can have a, a major impact um, on how we're feeling. So how do we approach depression? Um, really, we've got medication or psychotherapy from the very beginning here, okay? Our choice is going to be based on how severe the depression is. If it's more of a mild depression and a patient is interested in engaging in psychotherapy and has the means and time to do so, by all means, that's what you should do, okay? But more moderate degrees of depression, certainly severe depression, patients should be treated uh, with an anti-depressant. De uh, depressant. So not everyone might be interested in psychotherapy, even if you think that that's probably what's right for them. They don't have the time or the money to kind of dedicate to this maybe every week or every two weeks to do this. Uh, we want to take a good history and figure out what kind of medications that this patient has tried in the past for their depression. You'd be surprised how many times you see people present to the office complaining of depression. Um, and you know, if you didn't ask them, you wouldn't know that they may have tried Zoloft five years ago and it worked great for them. And the only reason that they stopped is because they started feeling better, right? At that point, you would just restart the Zoloft. There's good evidence to show that that's probably going to work for them um, again. You want to ask them about family history of what worked for family members, particularly siblings. You're going to be more genetically uh, similar to the patient. What's worked for them, maybe what's not. And then finally, we want to think about patient characteristics in terms of 
age group, medical comorbidity, and also symptom clusters. And in terms of symptom clusters, um, this goes into thinking about the, the idea that all antidepressants are equally efficacious in the treatment of depression. That's probably not true, okay, but the randomized trials that we have out there, there's, there's just really not an awful lot to suggest that there are differences. We would need much, much bigger randomized trials to show uh, distinct differences from uh, one antidepressant to, the, to another or differences between um, class. Because depression is really, it's kind of a heterogeneous illness, meaning that not everyone with depression is going to have the same type of symptom clusters, right? You might have a person who gets depressed and they eat too much when they get depressed. You might have another patient who doesn't eat enough. You have people who spend all day in bed, low energy, and you have some other people that are more anxious and kind of agitated pacing about. Those are two different people. So thinking that any old antidepressant is probably going to work just as well for person A as person B um, is probably not likely. Okay, we're going to need better research to show um, distinct differences, okay? In terms of how well antidepressants work, um, they don't really work that well, frankly, okay? About a third of the patients that you start on an antidepressant are going to achieve remission. Remission is where essentially all of the symptoms of depression are going to be gone. About half of the folks are going to show a response, which is a 50% improvement in whatever scale that you're using, okay? So they don't work. They, I wish they worked better, okay? Uh, when thinking about different patient groups, uh, with patients who are a little bit older, we want to think about drug-drug uh, interactions, okay? So things like Lexapro, Celexa, Zoloft, those tend to be pretty well tolerated um, and not too likely to cause different pharmacokinetic interactions. Same thing with Effexor and Remeron, okay? When we think about tricyclic antidepressants, uh, we, want to, we want to be very cautious with this. In elderly groups, uh, we're going to have an increased risk of falls, right? We're going to have an increased rate of confusion. So when we have orthostasis come about from a tricyclic antidepressant or anticholinergic effects that can cause worsening confusion, uh, we want to be very careful with that and maybe even think about a different, a different agent. And um, there's kind of a maxim when we're treating older patients with, with antidepressants or any medication for that matter is we typically want to start kind of low, go slow with our titration here. We want to be um, cautious, okay? But you want to go, right? Start low and go slow, but go, right? Try to reach your goal, try to get the patient better, but just be cautious with it. They have lower hepatic metabolism, decreased renal clearance, they tend to be smaller. Medical conditions, when we think about patients with different pain syndromes, they may benefit from what we would call dual acting agents. These are, these are, met, these are antidepressants with noradrenergic reuptake effects are, Cymbalta is a big one, right? It has an indication for pain with some patients. Patients with um, increased risk of seizure, um, if had stroke, head trauma, that kind of thing, you want to avoid tricyclic antidepressants and Wellbutrin, uh, which can decrease uh, seizure threshold. Arrhythmia, coronary artery disease, tricyclics aren't probably the best idea, right? Uh, tricyclics can serve as uh, type 1 antiarrhythmics, so people with any kind of like conduction problems, you want to be uh, vigilant. Uh, there because it could certainly make uh, conduction problems worse and uh, there can be an increased risk of mortality uh, when we have uh, patients who are taking tricyclic antidepressants with ischemic heart disease. Side effects. Uh, weight gain, really most of the antidepressants that we have these days tend to be weight neutral. Most patients who take SSRIs tend to lose a little bit of weight, not much, lose a little bit of weight when they first start taking it and then they tend to gain back the weight that they lost, okay? So it tends, to be, it tends to be weight neutral. When you have things like tricyclic antidepressants or older antidepressants and Remeron, this comes about from an H1 blockade, antihistaminergic um, blockade, which results in sedation, and it also results in increased appetite, okay? Uh, Prozac, Wellbutrin, they might be a little bit better, specifically Wellbutrin. People might lose a little bit of weight on that. Maybe 7% of people might lose weight on Wellbutrin, okay? Um, sexual side effects can be a problem, common uh, cause of non-compliance for, for sure. Um, <clears throat> probably over half the people you give antidepressants to are going to experience some sort of sexual side effect. Main, uh, the most common sexual side effects we look at may be anorgasmia, right, decreased libido, and sometimes erectile dysfunction. Again, that's going to happen in probably about 50% or more of folks. Maybe 10 to 15%, this might get better over 6 to 12 months, okay, but um, in many cases it just doesn't, unfortunately, okay. SSRIs, probably, Paxil's probably the worst of, uh, of the SSRIs to cause this, but when we think about other medications like Wellbutrin, Remeron, uh, 
uh, velazidone and vortioxetine here, uh, these tend to be um, a little bit better. Sometimes we add Welbutrin uh, to counteract sexual side effects, which sometimes works. Uh, we can also add Buspirone, uh, which can sometimes reverse this as well. Again, choosing target symptoms. A lot of times our patients are gonna have insomnia. We can choose an antidepressant like Remeron, right? Um, which, it, you know, it works pretty well for a lot of people. A lot of people gain weight on it. About three quarters of people are gonna gain about 7% of their body weight, which isn't insignificant, right? If you think about a 200 pound person, it's gonna be about 14 pounds, right? Um, trazodone can help. To get any kind of an antidepressant out of trazodone, you need to dose this pretty high. Uh, sometimes this can be a tolerability issue. You want that at least north of 150 milligrams if you're going to use that as an antidepressant and probably even higher. Uh, patients who tend to be kind of run down, Wellbutrin can help, right? It can give a little bit more energy. Prozac tends to be a little bit more stimulating. Not as stimulating as Wellbutrin, but it does just a little bit. Uh, patients who are complaining of uh, problems with focus, that kind of thing, um, noradrenergic agents can help. Uh, Dr. Beeman had mentioned uh, Wellbutrin, right? Uh, we can get kind of a noradrenergic effect from this, which can help with focus. Uh, Trintelix, there's some thought that it might help with processing speed. When we think about adequate dosage, we want to be careful. I'd already mentioned this with elderly patients. Start low and go slow. Want to do the same thing for patients who are on a lot of different medicines. With anxious patients, you want to start a little bit lower than you normally would, just because if you get too aggressive with an SSRI and an anxious patient, you can make them more anxious up front. Okay, so just be, just be slow with it. And our starting dose, at the bottom of our dosage range, that might not be enough, okay? So don't stop. If they're not responding after about four weeks, go ahead and increase the dose, okay? Uh, but what we do know is that with SSRIs, there tends to be a plateau, so you can't keep going forever, okay? This tends to round off with SSRIs. Um, this is from uh, Furukawa and his group. This was a meta-analysis that was published um, a few years back, I think 2019, uh, that looked at uh, kind of the efficacy plateau of, of a variety of antidepressants, really um, SSRIs here. And we see that the dosage here for these SSRIs are not too much beyond kind of the lower end of the dosage range here. Uh, you see the exception here with Effexor, which tends to be a little bit more linear with this response. Um, I'm hoping you all can see that. I'm going to leave that up for probably about 15 more seconds. So you can take a picture with your phone if you like. Oh, wonderful. Okay, never mind. Good to know. Thank you. Okay, so how long do we give an antidepressant? So four weeks is probably enough in an, as an adequate dose, okay? We want to think about dosage range. If we're starting a little bit lower, that's not going to count. We want to think about the patient being within um, the recommended dosage range for at least four weeks before you make an adjustment, okay? If they're, if they're in the dosage range and they come back to you after four weeks, they're not having any improvement, uh, then you want to go ahead and increase at that point. Um, you'll often see it read or written rather uh, that you know four to six weeks, maybe eight weeks to give an adequate trial, but really only about one in five people are going to go on and respond by eight weeks, right? So that's even more time that you've got a depressed patient that may not be responding to whatever you've prescribed. Okay, so that's what I do. I give them four weeks and an adequate dose, and if they're not any better, then I'm going to adjust it. I don't, you don't want to wait around, right? Specifically particularly for patients who are severely depressed, right? They need to get better. When we think about the definition of treatment resistance, um, research-wise, it's usually failure of uh, two different antidepressant trials for an adequate dose and duration, okay? Now, when we think about true treatment resistance, we want to make sure that our diagnosis is correct, okay? We, want to, we don't want to be treating someone with bipolar depression like they have unipolar depression because it's just not going to work as well, right? Um, it's a... It, completely different medications that you choose for bipolar depression. We want to make sure that they don't have some sort of substance abuse problem that we've not talked about. It might be a personality disorder that can sort of masquerade as a mood disorder sometime. Do we have the dose adequate? Did they take it long enough? And finally, are they compliant? When you think about increasing the dose with a patient, about a third of people haven't even been taking it appropriately, right? And some of this is really our fault because we don't do a great job of telling patients that they need to take an antidepressant every day for it to work. There's a remarkable number of people who take antidepressants as needed. Having a bad day, 
they take the antidepressant, right? And, you know, it, it's not going to be in their system uh, to where it's going to work like we want it to, okay? Okay. I want to focus on the STAR-D trial. This is an older trial. Uh, this finished up in 2004. Um, it was a big study all across the United States in primary care and also in psychiatric clinics. And it was really trying to match what we see in clinical practice, right? What do we do after the first antidepressant um, has failed? So this was an open label trial. This was not placebo controlled. Everyone knew what they were getting, okay? Everyone started off by getting um, Celexa. This was uh, 12 weeks. Uh, this medicine, all the medicines were flexibly dosed, so the, the practitioner could go up um, if they felt that they needed um, a little bit more. So if they did not reach remission or were otherwise unable to tolerate this medication, then they went on to the next step, okay? And when they went on to the next step, they could choose whether they went into a switch group or an augment group, okay? And within these groups, say in the switch group with Welbutrin, Zoloft, and Effexor, they were randomized to those, and there weren't any differences within these groups, and that was the same with every level, okay? So no, not one agent really outshined the other ones, okay? But the main thing I want you to focus on here is what happens with each successive step. When we look at remission with each successive step, it gets worse and worse and worse. By the, down, by the time you're down to your fourth endeavor, there may be about 13% of people who are remitting. That's pretty bad, right? And you look at the graph on the right, we see that the more treatment-resistant groups in step three and step four, when you follow these people, even if they did remit, tended to relapse sooner, right? So this is just indicative of the fact um, that patients uh, with treatment-resistant resistance tend to relapse a little bit um, sooner. All in all, when you look at after all the different steps, about two-thirds of people, 67% ended up reaching remission, okay? So that leads a third of people, even after aggressive management of their antidepressants, four different tries that are still depressed. They didn't reach remission, okay? It took a total of um, seven weeks. Uh, that was the mean average uh, to reach remission for most of these patients. Okay, so we've started someone on an antidepressant. We've given adequate dose. We've increased it at least once. We're getting nothing out of it. So what do we do now? So what we can do is we can either switch medications or we can augment. And what I mean by augment is just to add another medication on. And all in all, augmentation may be a little bit more effective than switching to a new medication. And I'll leave this with a caveat. I don't tend to augment medications that aren't working anyway because you run into the problem of giving someone two medications, one of which might not be working at all, right? So I only augment medications that are only working partially, right? Um, switching, I tend to switch to a medication from a different class. If I've started someone on, say, Zoloft, which is an SSRI, I'm not gonna switch to another SSRI, though uh, the data from the uh, STAR-D trial shows that there's no difference. Just intuitively, I think it makes sense to try something from a different um, class. For patients who are dealing with a lot of conflict in their life, et cetera, adding psychotherapy is more than reasonable for most patients. There's no real clear guidance on how many augmentation strategies you want to try before switching or vice versa. So with augmentation, there are a number of different medications that you can add. We're going to talk about a meta-analysis that looked at all sorts of different stuff with the exception of um, nutraceuticals like SAMe or methylfolate, that kind of thing. But I'm going to focus on some of the more common um, strategies that we might use that have been around for a number of um, of years. Most of the data, most of the evidence comes from using a second generation antipsychotic or using lithium. Those are going to be the two, two uh, uh, classes that have the most data uh, behind them. We want to be considerate of the fact that augmenting medications comes with the risk of just adding more side effects, right? That's obvious. It costs more in compliance, right? More medications the patient takes, the less likely they are to take it appropriately. So when we look how efficacious this is, uh, this was from a meta-analysis done in 2009 that looked at 16 different trials uh, for different atypicals, which included ser uh, Seroquel, Olanzapine, uh, Aripiprazole, and Risperdal. Okay. Um, all in all, the remission, the odds ratio here uh, was two, right? So odds were uh, two times higher uh, with, with these different atypicals versus uh, placebo. Uh, 
there wasn't really any difference um, in the odds ratios between the atypicals. And luckily, you can see some response with using atypical medications within maybe about a week or a week and a half. So they work pretty rapidly. Okay. I usually give it about four weeks at least before I make a dose adjustment, however. <clears throat> Lithium, this is an old strategy, but still works really well for people, okay? Most of the data that comes from lithium uh, comes from augmentation with tricyclic antidepressants, some older data. But uh, response rate, uh, 2.89 odds ratio, not too bad. Um, onset of action can be varied, right? But you're gonna have about three quarters of people respond within a couple of weeks. You're gonna dose this about like you would dose someone with bipolar disorder, right? Shoot for a level of about 0.6 or 0.9. Most people here, that's gonna be about 900 milligrams, okay? You wanna think a little bit lower in someone who's a little bit older, whose kidneys aren't as good. Remeron, uh, this is a medication that we'll often add to an antidepressant to get it to work a little bit better, specifically for people who aren't sleeping well, might have decreased appetite, it can certainly help here. With the STAR-D trial, you know, it was given just at the end. They had already failed three different trials from other things, right? So this was a, a very treatment-resistant uh, crowd. Um, there was only about 14% of people who were admitted uh, with Remeron plus venlafaxine. Another study that looked um, at Remeron here, uh, these are 480 primary care patients. Essentially, they were just randomized uh, to mirtazapine uh, 30 milligrams or placebo over a year's time to the antidepressant that they were already taking. And unfortunately, it did not separate uh, from placebo very well. Uh, but the limitation with the studies, they only went to 30 milligrams, right? A lot of times you wanna to go to about 45 before giving up on mirtazapine, but it did not separate from placebo. Okay, this was a good study here. So Wellbutrin, this is a medication that we use uh, quite a bit. This is great for patients who are complaining of poor concentration. This is something that Dr. Beeman had already mentioned. Patients who are trying to quit smoking, patients who might wanna lose a little bit of weight. Patients with Wellbutrin might lose about 7% of their weight, okay? Uh, this, is around, this is probably north of 300 milligrams, however. Um, so they're either switched to Wellbutrin, augmented with Wellbutrin, or augmented with Aripiprazole or Abilify. And Abilify, uh, one here, okay, and it separated significantly from switching to Wellbutrin, but did not uh, separate significantly from um, augmentation with Wellbutrin. So it did, did about as well. This was a pretty treatment-resistant crowd, too. They had failed uh, two to three um, antidepressants already. Thyroid hormone, this is another old one, uh, like lithium is an old one. Uh, when we look at the STAR-D trial, about 25% of people um, had remitted. This was kind of a moderate level of treatment resistance, about two trials of antidepressants. Um, open label trials with studies with SSRIs are positive. And we'll talk about a meta-analysis here in a little bit that shows that thyroid hormone did actually very well. And when I talk about thyroid hormone, this is T3, cytomel, triiodothyronine. Okay, so if you're going to use this, this is a very well-tolerated uh, type of augmentation uh, medication that we might want to use. Check a TSH before you do. Uh, you wanna make sure that this is at least above 0.5. Um, I didn't include this in uh, a slide here, but there is some data to suggest that patients with the TSH more than 2.5 don't respond as well to antidepressants, and this is regardless of T3 or T4 levels. It's interesting. This needs to be replicated probably uh, with other studies, but it's something to consider. Um, we should think about drawing TSHs when patients are showing a pretty good degree of treatment resistance. So you're gonna start 25 micrograms, go up to 50 in a couple of weeks if it's not working, give it about six weeks on the 50, okay? Check a TSH a month later and then yearly. You wanna be a little bit cautious with augmenting with thyroid hormone to people who are euthyroid with cardiovascular disease, right? It can increase uh, myocardial uh, oxygen demand. Okay, so let's look at a more recent uh, study here. This is a big meta-analysis, <clears throat> 65 different um, studies, 19 different agents, okay? This was a low degree of treatment resistance. They had only been refractory to maybe one or more uh, a, uh, um, antidepressant agents. So the, uh, the agents they looked at, we had stimulant group, we had things like Vyvanse, Adderall, Ritalin, um, even things like Modafinil. Thyroid hormones were looked at, T3 and T4. Uh, mood stabilizers were investigated, lithium and lamotrigine. Lamotrigine, I was almost surprised that they even studied. Lamotrigine doesn't have any place in treating unipolar depression. There's just no data to suggest it, okay? It's really good as a maintenance drug with bipolar disorder, but for unipolar depression, I wouldn't think about using it really at all. Atypical antipsychotics, 
a number of these here, and the same antidepressants that we had seen in the STAR-D trial, maybe with the exception of amitriptyline. Uh, they had also looked at buspirone, which is a medicine that we often give for anxiety. It's not really an antidepressant. It's a 5-HT1A uh, partial agonist. And incidentally, you can give this with antidepressants to counteract sexual side effects. This tends to work pretty well for people. So if someone is anxious and sexual side effects with an SSRI, think about adding boost bar. It can, it can sometimes work. Okay, so let's see how they did here. So the ones that separated from placebo, we see that the um, atypical antipsychotics, things like brexpiprazole, Seroquel, olanzapine, cariprazine, these all separated well. Uh, from placebo. We also see that T3 and lithium also did well, right? It's nice to see that sort of backed up. Even modafinil did pretty well, right? And the authors had concluded that their findings were consistent with um, many guidelines that suggest that you want to start off first line with an atypical antipsychotic when you're augmenting an antidepressant, particularly aripiprazole and Seroquel. That's what has the most data behind it, okay? We've got a few that are approved for it, but aripiprazole and quetiapine or Seroquel um, tends to have the most. <clears throat> okay, uh, look at another recent trial. This, these were in geriatric patients. And the reason I like this trial is number one, the very first step replicates almost exactly that study that I was talking about earlier with, with people who were augmented with Abilify or augmented with Wellbutrin or switched to Bilpropion, right? Uh, the reason I like this is it's a little bit like the STAR-D trial is, is because you get to see what happens next when you try the next step with the same group of patients, okay? Um, the findings were exactly like uh, we saw in that uh, VA study that we were just talking about. Aripiprazole augmentation did the best, right? And it did separate significantly from switching to bupropion, but did not uh, separate statistically uh, from augmenting with bupropion. When they went on to switch uh, to nortriptyline and uh, lithium, those two did not separate from one another. They, they performed just about as well. Um, you want to be careful, I think, when, as I mentioned before, of, of starting an, uh, a tricyclic antidepressant in patients who are elderly just because it can cause orthostasis and anticholinergic effects, right? Nortriptyline is a secondary amine, which means that it, the, the side effects from that are not going to be as bad as a tertiary amine like amitriptyline, okay? It's a little bit better tolerated. Just be careful with it, okay? But it's still an option. If you're thinking about using lithium, you want to think about renal function in older folks. Okay, so we'll talk about more novel approaches that we might have uh, beyond <clears throat> just adding our, our uh, uh, more commonly used medications. So ketamine, the history of this goes back probably to the 1960s where Park Davis wanted to find an answer, find a replacement for fencyclidine. If you can believe it, they were using PCP angel dust <laughs> as an anesthetic medication, right? And so for obvious reasons, uh, the post-emergent delir post delirium that they would have in the PACU, uh, they wanted to get away from using PCP. PCP is actually an NMDA antagonist, which is where ketamine works. It works in very much the same uh, type of way. After a while, they had noticed that even sub-anesthetic doses of ketamine would cause decrease in anxiety, decrease in depressive-like symptoms in rats. And then ultimately, we started using IV ketamine for treatment-resistant depression and still are um, these days. Um, in terms of mechanisms, I'd already mentioned this. It's an NMDA antagonist, which means that ultimately downstream, it's going to increase dopamine and increase brain-derived neurotropic factor, which helps support neuronal function and growth. Okay. Interestingly enough, um, you can knock out the antidepressant effect of, of ketamine by adding naltrexone. So there's some involvement with the opioid system that we haven't quite figured out yet, okay? Um, Spravato S-ketamine, it's intranasal ketamine. It's the um, S enantiomer of uh, ketamine. It tends to be a little bit more, it tends to be tolerated a little bit better, fewer psychomimetic effects uh, as opposed to racemic um, ketamine. Um, this was approved in, in 2019 in March, and it's for use with an antidepressant. Okay, um, this was the pivotal phase three trial that got uh, S-ketamine approved. The other two trials actually did not separate from placebo, okay? So um, all patients were started on a new antidepressant and were either given a saline nasal spray or S-ketamine. Uh, this was given twice a week, and they were followed out for about a month. And we see here that it does indeed uh, separate pretty well from placebo, but not, not by an awful lot. This was done on the Montgomery Asperg Depression Rating Scale, which is a scale from 0 to 60. So five points here um, is not 
super impressive, uh, but it, it did indeed, indeed separate. When we think about the overall response rate, 69% responded, 53% reached remission uh, with this medication. Okay, so following people out who in fact did respond well to ketamine, they were followed for about a year and a half, okay, and they continued their, their S-ketamine or they were continued on a placebo um, given every week or every other week. And those who were taking the S-ketamine plus the antidepressant, the relapse in responders and remitters, about 26, 27%, quite a bit less uh, than we see with the placebo. So for the people it worked well for, it seems to keep them pretty well, okay? Okay, so we'll talk very briefly here about transcranial magnetic stimulation. Essentially, what the, this is just a machine that sets up a rapidly alternating magnetic field just over the scalp, okay? And we might remember from physics Faraday's induction principle, right? When we set up an alternating magnetic field over something that can carry current, it's going to induce current in something, okay? And what this induces current is, is essentially your neurons. It depolarizes neurons right underneath the area that's being stimulated. We're not exactly sure how this works, but somehow through stimulating these cortical areas, it sort of rewires these pathological networks that are involved um, in mood. Um, this is a pretty simple procedure. The patient sits in something that looks kind of like a dentist chair, okay? It's about 20 to 40 minutes. They do it about five times a week. And the nice thing about TMS is it's essentially side effect free. I mean, people might get a headache. It's kind of loud. Some people complain of some scalp pain, but they don't need anesthetic. They don't need a driver. They don't need anything. Right? So someone who's maybe a moderate level of depression who just can't tolerate medications and insurance is going to do a good job of paying for TMS, this might be uh, uh, a good option for them. <clears throat> Excuse me. We look at response, about 26% compared to, compared to sham treatment. Remission, about 21%. So not great, but it's still there. It's pretty good for something that doesn't cause any side effects. Okay, so we'll finish up talking about electroconvulsive therapy. Really, this is the gold standard for treatment-resistant depression when you're hitting a wall with, with antidepressants, okay? Essentially, what this, what this procedure looks like is a patient um, is given um, a dose of, uh, usually what we use is methohexital through an IV. We don't use gas or anything like that. After we've achieved general anesthesia, they're completely asleep, okay? We give medicine, medicine called succinylcholine, which relaxes their muscles to a very deep degree. And we've determined that they're completely relaxed. It's going to stimulate the brain uh, with a small current of electricity to induce a generalized seizure. But the patient doesn't have a generalized seizure like anyone else would because this muscle, this muscle relaxing medication prevents these big convulsions uh, from occurring. Okay? These patients are being monitored through EKG. Also being monitored through EEG. The electroencephalogram is being looked at. Seizure lasts anywhere from probably about 30 seconds to about 90 seconds or so, and then the patient's awake in about seven minutes and then goes to the recovery room, 30, 45 minutes, and then goes home, okay? We're not exactly sure how this works. A little bit like TMS, it's a little bit of a mystery. There's so many different things that happen with ECT. We know that some of these monoamines get released, like we were talking about serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, right? There's some thought that neuroendocrine uh, factors come into play. We can see releases of thyroid stimulating hormone, endorphins, right? There's some thought that even the anticonvulsant properties of e uh, ECT uh, tend to improve mood. It's sort of paradoxical. It's like, why would seizures be an anticonvulsant? But the more seizures someone has, their seizure threshold tends to rise with, with repeated treatments. And there's some thought that that's associated with improvement with mood, okay? And lastly, there's some thought that neurogenesis can play a role. Interestingly enough, ECT sort of stimulates the brain to grow in some of the same areas where depression will kill brain cells, right? With, with long periods of chronic depression, you can have atrophy in your hippocampus. It's not good for your brain at all. With ECT, you can see these cells start to grow back. New vascular connections are formed, synaptogenesis. Okay. The thought of, of using seizures to treat mental illness goes back a long ways, but even back to the 1500s, okay, where they were using things like camphor to induce seizures. Uh, in more modern times, around 1934, a Hungarian psychiatrist named Meduna kind of observed that the patients that he was treating with schizophrenia tended to get better when they would have seizures. It was odd, right? They would have a seizure for whatever reason, and, it's, and their symptoms seemed to improve at least temporarily, right? And he observed on autopsy that these patients with schizophrenia had this paucity, or lack rather, 
of the glial cells in their brain, as opposed to people who had epilepsy who had an overabundance of these glial cells. And he thought that there was some sort of an antagonistic relationship between seizure and the symptomatology that he saw there. So he also used CAM4 to induce seizures, um, had good benefit from it. There was another medication that he used later on called metrazole. So this was in vogue for a little bit until a couple of Italian psychiatrists got into using electricity uh, to induce therapeutic seizures. They were doing um, epilepsy research with animals and were using uh, electricity to induce seizures, and it was a very reliable method to do that. It was a lot more reliable than chemical agents. It wasn't as painful as chemical agents, right? And after a few years, this was what we used for mood disorders, right? This was the go-to thing for people who were significantly depressed. <clears throat> so we reached the 1950s when we start seeing the advent of antidepressants. So obviously the use of ECT can kind of drop off. There is some negative media associated with ECT, some of which uh, was probably deserved. Um, early ECT was pretty rough, okay? There wasn't any anesthesia involved. There wasn't any oxygen involved. There was no e electroencephalogram being monitored at all, no muscle relaxing, nothing like that. So they would essentially be stimulated with electricity and be held down while they're having a seizure. That's pretty brutal, right? But these days, it's a completely different ball game. The machines we have are much more nuanced and the, the amount of electricity that we can deliver just enough to, to stimulate their brain to have a seizure according to their seizure threshold, which is always, the way that I do it is always customized, okay? So it's different. It's different than it used to be. So indications for ECT is a primary treatment. We don't typically use this as a primary treatment unless it's a very urgent type of um, situation. If we've got somebody who's essentially starving themselves because they're depressed or catatonic, um, because they're so depressed, um, ECT may be used as a good primary treatment. Or if in the past that you've e used ECT with good benefit from their mood disorder, go ahead and start it. You know that's what's gonna, that, that it's going to work. So there's no need to, to mess around with, with medications at that point. But most of the patients that I see, um, we use this as a secondary to treatment. They come to me, they've failed a few different medications, or otherwise they've been able to, to not tolerate them well because of the side effects. Um, Unfortunately, most of the patients that I see have been on something like eight, nine, ten different antidepressants that have been depressed for years, some of them severely, which is way too late. They should have seen me a lot sooner. When we think about considering ECT, it's the same type of considerations that we take into account when we think about treatment-resistant depression. Do we have an accurate diagnosis? Are they abusing substances? Are they taking medications appropriately? They have medical comorbidities like untreated sleep apnea, hypothyroidism, that kind of thing. Have they had an adequate trial? What do they prefer? Right, some patients like, you know, look, I know another antidepressant may work. When we think of the STAR-D trial, when you're down on your fourth endeavor, it's like 14% of people might remit. You wanna give patient a fifth medicine and wait another four to six weeks where they might not get better? I don't know. I mean, that's gonna be up to the patient, right? But it's nice that we have an option uh, that works well for patients. When we look about the uh, efficacy of ECT response rate, these are treatment-resistant people, okay? This response rate's gonna be about three-quarters of people are gonna respond. A little over half are gonna remit. For bipolar depression, it's even better, okay? And they tend to respond even sooner. When we think about comparison with antidepressant medications, looking at a number of different classes, including MAOIs, odds of response compared to medications is gonna be about four, time, four times higher, okay? Compared with TMS, um, again, remission rate about 50, 53% remission rate with TMS. Uh, you know, about half that. ECT tends to work pretty quickly. Um, we tend to th see what we call objective symptoms improve first. And what do I mean by objective symptoms? This is stuff that others can see. Changes in sleep, appetite, energy, motivation, that kind of thing. That's going to improve uh, before someone is going to give you a subjective improvement in uh, mood. Like people, like my family, I don't feel any different, but my family looks, thinks I'm doing a little bit better. We can even see improvement in the first week, complete remission in about three to four weeks, okay? Typical number of treatments that I use to get someone to um, remission is going to be uh, between about seven and eight. That's gonna be about three weeks, okay? Uh, one, one study showed that about three quarters, I'm sorry, about, about a third of people are going to show remission in uh, less than two weeks and about two thirds within um, three weeks. And more than half had actually had an initial response by their third treatment, which is just a week. Some of the factors we think about when uh, predicting a positive response with uh, ECT, people who are sort of have psychomotor retardation, meaning that they're sort of slowed down. Patients complain this, like they feel like they're carrying a big weight around with them. 
patients who have psychotic uh, symptoms along with their depression tend to do a little bit better. Patients who are catatonic can do better. ECT is kind of the gold standard too uh, when you have a patient who's catatonic that's not responding to benzodiazepines. Okay, that's the, that is the treatment of choice. Patients who are older tend to respond better to ECT, interestingly. Um, some negative factors uh, that can be associated with non-response with ECT. People who have been depressed maybe for years and years, uh, you might have a, a worse outcome. Patients with borderline personality disorder sometimes can have negative outcomes. Um, but I, uh, I want to make note of the fact that that's not a, a, a contraindication to getting ECT. Just because someone has borderline personality disorder does not mean that they don't have a mood disorder too. Okay, what you don't want to do is treat borderline personality disorder, just borderline personality disorder with ECT because it's not going to work. Okay, it's a very safe procedure. When we look at the mortality with ECT, it's roughly the same as it is with general anesthesia, about two to 10 per 100,000 people. Headache, muscle soreness, nausea, that's, those can be common side effects. Okay, that, those typically get better after about the first week or so. Uh, cognitive side effects, this is the major concern that most people have, okay. Um, we can commonly run into problems with short-term memory loss. That can be a common side effect with ECT, okay? But the most important thing to remember is that this is a temporary phenomenon. There's a big, big meta-analysis that looked at this, okay? And about a week or two after you're finished with ECT, problems with memory, executive function, all that comes back uh, completely to normal. And a lot of times people will note that their memory and cognitive function overall is even better after ECT, after they've recovered from it for about a week or two, just because they're not as depressed. It's very seldom when you find someone who's significantly depressed that will tell you that they're thinking very clearly, they're able to make decisions well, et cetera. Okay, so sometimes this can even be uh, better. Just want, it's not associated with any sort of brain damage. Okay, I want to dispel that myth. Okay, so in summary, uh, depression is a rather common illness. We're gonna see this in about one in five people within their lifetimes might have an episode of major depression. Antidepressants, they work well for a lot of people, but you know, their success rate is just not the greatest. Only about a half, of, a half of our patients are going to respond, and then about a third will remit to initial course of antidepressant treatment. About a third of our patients will have treatment-resistant depression. Remember from the study, study that about two-thirds of patients um, are going to reach remission even after aggressive treatment with four different uh, steps. Switching or augmenting with different medications, typically atypical antipsychotics with emphasis on uh, aripiprazole. Um, and also Seroquel are going to be some of your very first steps. And then finally, ECT, uh, that should really be given strong consideration if you're hitting a roadblock with medications. Okay, so I'll stop there and take questions. Yeah, yeah, Uvality, that, I've, I have yet to use that. So Uvality is, is a combination, I'll get back in front of the mic. Uvality is a combination medis, medicine with dextromethorphan and buprenorphine, okay? And dextromethorphan works in a similar way that ketamine works. It's an NMDA antagonist, but it's, it's also a serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, okay? So it's thought to work in similar ways that, that, uh, that ketamine does. And the reason it's given with, with buprenorphine is that the metabolism of dextromethorphan is rather rapid, okay? It's metabolized by the 2D6 isoenzyme, right? So you need to give something along with this to prevent it from being broken down, okay? I have yet to use it. It seems to per work pretty well. If I recall, I think about 40% of people respond to it. It's not indicated for treatment-resistant depression yet, um, just for major depressive disorder. Right. I think they used to, I don't know if they're still doing that at St. Anthony's or not. Um, I'm not sure if they're still doing that or not. I've treated some people from around the Oklahoma City area, so I, I just don't know. But that's where they were doing it anyway. They usually go through psychiatry first. Yep. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would refer them to a psychiatrist and um, have them go on from a referral from there. You said, how often do I do ECT? Right, so that's a big part of my practice, is doing ECT. Um, 
you know, um, I get a number of different consults. I've got quite a line of people waiting in to get in to see me for ECT. But using it as a first line treatment, not very commonly at all. Okay, the, I would, almost all patients that I see for ECT have come in after failing a number of different um, trials of antidepressants. Now sometimes we, we, we will use this first line in the hospital. There's some hospitalized patients that I'll treat that have catatonic sy symptoms that have not responded to benzodiazepines and I'll absolutely do, do ECT then. Yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. I think we have a question over here. One of you guys have a question. Could be seeing things that's getting towards the end of the day. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Yeah, that's going to be roughly the same rate of death that you would see from general anesthesia. So they're getting general anesthesia too. So the idea there is there's no real additive risk of death with ECT. Now, we want to be cautious with doing ECT on, for people who maybe have had like a stroke within the last four weeks, had a heart attack in the last four weeks, or may have like a big mass in their brain. But otherwise, it's an incredibly safe procedure. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. You know, we want to, they get a history and physical with attention, with, with focus on, you know, neurological exam. You know, if they have any suggestion of increased intracranial pressure, no. But, but as a rule, as a rule, no. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thank you.